Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am Zach Peterson. I'm a technical consultant with Altium and today we're gonna look at a viewer question about differential pair routing and specifically with how to calculate the length tuning limit that you need in your design rules. So let's take a look at a quick question from one of our viewers on the Altium Academy YouTube channel. Itor Sierra asks, Altium Academy, how do you calculate the exact value of the length? Is it possible to make a video showing it in Altium? So that was on our length tuning uh, video that we did previously about differential pairs. So that's what we're gonna look at today. Let's go ahead and get started. First things first, we wanna calculate the length tuning limit on a differential pair. So how do we actually do that? So we're gonna show some of the steps that you need to do in Altium Designer to kind of get you to that point. The fact is though that you're not actually gonna do everything in Altium Designer. And part of the reason for that is because you need some data from the data sheet. So we're gonna look for a component, then we're gonna look it up in the data sheet and we're gonna find the information that we need and then we're gonna use a result in the Altium Designer Layer Stack Manager in order to actually do that calculation for the length limit. And then we'll kind of analyze this and see, you know, does it make sense? What would happen if we change the rise time or anything like this? And then we'll kind of see a little bit more when we really need to get really tight with our length matching. First, uh, you can see here, I'm inside of Altium Designer. Um, I'm just gonna create a new PCB stack up. Let's just say I'm gonna use like a Surtees uh, line driver. Um, to, to, to do this kind of demo. So we need to do two things. First, we need to have a stack up already. So I'm gonna create just kind of like a basic stack up here real quick while I'm talking. And uh, to do that, you just go into the layer stack manager. We'll do it on standard thickness. So, you know, 62 mils, just kind of as a contrived example. And we'll make it, uh, we'll go ahead and make it a four layer board. Okay, so I'm gonna set my core thickness as, we'll just call it 40. I'll call my dielectric outer thicknesses seven. You'll see my total thickness is, it's just shy of 62 mils. Uh, we'll just call it 7.5 on the outer, th uh, outer thickness. And now, basically with this, we're ready to start calculating some impedances. So we could do this in one of two ways. We could say, we're gonna plan to do the routing on the outer layer or we could plan to do, it, do, to do it on an inner layer. Either way, we can get an impedance, and then from the impedance, all team designer is gonna give us a uh, propagation constant value. So it's this propagation value that we're gonna use with something in the data sheet to actually calculate the length tuning limits. Now, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'm just gonna re repeat this because it is actually kind of important. So just because you get a length dimension or you get a length specification in a data sheet for a component, it doesn't necessarily mean that it applies to your specific board. They may be talking about an outer layer versus an inner layer. They may be talking about one type of dielectric, whereas you're on a totally different dielectric with a different DK value. That's gonna change those length limits. However, if you can get the, co the uh, propagation constant value from your layer stack, then you can use that to figure out what the length limit is based on uh, time data from the data sheet. So you really wanna use the time data. So here, I'm just gonna add in an impedance profile. We're gonna make this a differential profile. Um, let's just go with 100 ohms. And then right down here uh, where my mouse is, you can see this delay TP value. Uh, that is your propagation delay. So now that we have the propagation delay value, we can use that with a timing value from a data sheet to actually get a, uh, a length limit. I'm just gonna keep this open and we'll go over here to Chrome. Let's go with uh, Surtees driver and see what we get. So, um, all right, so here I'm on Newark, and let's go with this uh, TI line driver. So I've got the part number. Uh, to get the data sheet, I'm gonna go over to Octopart, put it in, and here you can see the component comes up. Also very nice, you can see that it's in stock all over the place, so if we actually wanted to use this in a real design, we'd be in luck. Um, so now I'm on TI's site, and I'm looking at the data sheet. So once you're in the data sheet, what you wanna do is you wanna look for something very specific, okay? You wanna look for the word skew. Most of the time, when I say most, I mean like 90% of the time, 
if you type in skew into your control F here, you can see I was already looking a little earlier on something, but if you type this in and search for it, you'll eventually be able to see what the skew margin is. So they might call it skew margin, they might just call it allowed skew or skew limit or something like this. But you can see here from this, uh, from this diagram uh, that we're able to get this uh, little timing diagram here that shows what the LVDS timing margin is. So this basically tells us what our uh, deterministic jitter limit is, but that's one of the things that's gonna create skew for us. You can actually use this value if you like to set up the routing rules. So this is already gonna be a little more conservative than what you need, typically, you know, differential receivers are actually crossing detectors. So they're really just detecting when the two signals cross each other. Here you can see we're kind of below this, you know, low and high threshold where they cross. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this deterministic jitter limit to actually figure out what, uh, the, what the actual length limit is. So here, if I just kind of search uh, DJIT, you can see it's right here. They've got this, uh, Texas Instruments is really good about this with their uh, data sheets. If they show a symbol like, you know, T sub DJIT in a timing diagram, it's gonna be listed, it's usually listed somewhere else in the table. You can see right here, we've got our switching characteristics. This is pretty much everything that we're gonna need to be able to figure out what is an acceptable, uh, what is an acceptable length limitation or length length mismatch limitation uh, once we're back in Team Designer. Here, I've got two values, right? 230 picoseconds and 150 picoseconds. So one of the things that we've talked about in the past is that, you know, what, what level of precision do you really need? The thing about CAD tools is they actually let you get very, very precise. And so as we're gonna see here, because if you remember, the propagation delay was actually 130 picoseconds per inch. And this is measured in about 150 picoseconds. So our mismatch is gonna be about an inch. We'll calculate the exact value here in just a moment. So that's a pretty generous mismatch that this allows for deterministic jitter. And you can see all of these variables, or all of these variables here for this, uh, this jitter limit are really similar to the low to high transition time. So there's a lot of variation that can actually happen with this differential signal, because again, the detector is a crossing detector. It's basically just detecting when the two signals cross each other in that timing diagram. And that's what's actually gonna trigger that shift from the low to the high value. Here you can see with 150 picoseconds, I'm just gonna open up my little calculator here. So 150 picoseconds, I'm gonna divide that by uh, here, 138.27, and I get 1.084 inches. So that's a lot of variation that you can have. and you might be thinking, well, that's a huge variation. What, what happens here? So you can have that level of variation because the signals are traveling so quickly and the rise time is, it's long, but it's not too long. The signal is gonna travel quite a bit of distance, especially when you think about it in terms of the lengths uh, of a PCB. The signal is gonna travel a pretty decent distance even in that short amount of time. And so that's exactly what we see here given this propagation delay and then one of these values that we were able to get out of a data sheet. You're probably not gonna have a situation where you're driving a Surtees, uh, a Surtees line and then you're gonna have to have a mismatch of like an inch or more. Typically, maybe you have to like ride around a via or something like that. Maybe you'll get, you know, what, 20 mils or more or something like that. But remember, this is an inch, so this is like a thousand mils. So that's a pretty big mismatch. This is just our differential pair profile. Normally what people will do is they'll usually also create a single-ended profile on the same layer. You'll notice here we're in microstrip configuration, so the width is gonna come out to be a lot wider at half the impedance compared to the differential pair width. So I bring that up because the differential pair width, if we're gonna route these two things together as a differential pair, that is the width that we wanna use when we actually set up our design rule. Now, we have a single-ended impedance here. You'll notice it's 13.76. You might be wondering, why is that so, so wide? It's because, again, when we have a differential pair, we bring the two traces close together. Right here, by default, it sets five mils. What happens is the coupling between the two is what actually sets the differential impedance and the single-ended impedance of a trace in the pair to that half value of the differential impedance, or in this case, 50 ohms. So as long as you route these two together, that individual impedance of one of those traces in the pair 
will be 50 ohms. If you're planning on separating them for any reason, if you're gonna pull a Rick Hartley and route them on the, around the outside of a board with you know the separated by whatever the board width is, then you would want to enforce this single-ended impedance profile. So we're just gonna work with the differential impedance profile for the moment. So now they're both set up, and I'm gonna go back over here to the PCB, and uh, I'm just gonna go in and set up the design rules. So um, here I've got the differential pair routing rules open. It's under routing and then differential pair routing. Here it's just kind of set by default. And so you'll see right here, there's a little drop down. It says use impedance profile. Right here is where you would select the differential impedance profile. You would then want to assign it to a differential pair or a differential pair net class. Now. Here in this project, we obviously don't have any nets attached to this PCB because we just created a blank PCB and kind of went into the layer stack manager. In a real project, you would apply a differential pair directive to objects in the schematic, and that would, that would define them as differential pairs in the project. Then once you go into the PCB in the same project, you'd actually see those nets show up. So that's the first one, okay? That sets the, lit, the, the width and the spacing, okay? So that's the first design rule that we would need. So the next one that we need is down here. It is uh, matched lengths. And so it's under the high speed design rules. Now here I'm just gonna click new rule because by default it's not populated. But this is where we're now gonna set our length tolerance. So you can actually do this in delay units if you want, or you can do it in length units. Now, here, if I select that same differential pair class that I selected in the differential pairs routing rule, I can then just use the length limits that I've calculated and enter it in here in the tolerance. So you see here, it actually sets a default of a thousand mils. It's a pretty big length tolerance. You could also uh, select this, select, uh, set this as a delay value if you want, okay? So you can do it either way. But if you really wanna know the length and control the length, I would just do it by, by length units, okay? That's the way I prefer to do it anyways. So that's pretty much everything that you need. Now you'll notice here that we didn't, you, you're not setting a differential pair impedance profile in this design rule. You actually did that in the routing rule, okay? So that's what's gonna maintain your spacing and your trace width within that pair. Then you come down here to match lengths and you can set the length tolerance. And then um, here I would just enter in, uh, basically I would wanna enter in my, you know, 1,084 mils, cause that's you know, technically the length tolerance here. If I wanna get, you know, a little tighter, set it at 50 mils. Obviously I would assign this to the relevant differential pair class that I created in the schematic. Hit okay, and we're ready to start routing. So as you go and access the interactive differential pair routing tool, you can then use that to set the routing and, you know, around the board. And as you do that, it's actually going to obey the, uh, the differential pair impedance profile that you set in the design rules is gonna do that automatically. So you won't have to manually go back and check stuff like the trace spacing and the trace width. A little bit later, what I'll actually do is we'll make another video that actually shows like how to apply the length matching tool. So how to actually apply the length matching segments. If you wanna play with it yourself in the meantime, it's actually really easy to access. Um, it's just right here. So you can see the interactive length tuning that applies just to single ended signals. So let's say you had two traces in a differential pair. One of them was really heavily mismatched, so one of them is a lot longer. You can apply the single-ended length tuning to the other one, or you can use the differential pair length tuning tool. So that's essentially how you would access and use that particular tool. And you would wanna do that after you set the routing up. As you do that, you'll see a visual cue that shows you when you're within your, uh, your tolerance for length matching, and um, then you're pretty much done. So just some advice with actually routing this stuff in the PCB layout. What I would recommend you do is you actually do that routing that involves differential pair that might need some length matching first because you wanna get that length matching correct and then lay out all the other stuff that doesn't really need any length matching or even any constraints on length, stuff like lower speed buses. The reason you wanna do that is you don't wanna lay out a bunch of low speed buses and then try to route your differential pairs and then find that you don't actually have room to do that. Then you gotta go back and change a bunch of stuff, which is a real headache. So handle that stuff first that needs the differential pair uh, routing and needs to have length matching, do all that stuff first, then come back and do the other stuff. Same thing if you've got like a parallel bus, so um, like DDR routing, you basically got a bunch of lines that have to be routed in parallel and length matched, do that first. That one's a really wide bus, so it's gonna take up a lot of room. 
do that first and then come back and do the low speed stuff. Hopefully this shows you what you might need to look for in a data sheet to actually figure out a limit on your length matching when you're doing any kind of differential pair routing. Now, we looked at a relatively slow, in terms of you know high-speed digital components, we looked at a relatively slow component. This particular component has, you know, in the nanosecond range rise times, but if you're working with something a lot faster, those length limitations that you are allowed to have in, in you know, in your mismatch and your routing, those length limitations are also gonna go down. So let's just suppose for a moment that we were dealing with a line driver that had um, 100 picoseconds seconds rise time, so factor 10 lower, what's gonna to happen to our skew margin? You would also reasonably expect it to reduce by a factor 10, which means your length tolerance also reduces by a factor 10. So now we've just gone from a length tolerance of one inch to a 10th of an inch. So you can already see what happens when you get to higher and higher speeds. And that 100 picoseconds number that I just mentioned, that's not something that is totally out of the ordinary with today's components. So just keep that in mind. If you like the video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, Go and leave your comments and questions in the comments section. We love getting your questions and we'll keep getting to more of this stuff and doing more examples inside of Altium Designer. And if you haven't gotten your free trial yet, go check out the link in the description and you can get your own free trial. Thanks everybody and uh, definitely don't forget to call your fabricator.